Yeah, uh, I do not get out very much. I'm usually just working at Microsoft. Uh, I don't um, talk to people very much like this. I used to do that more, uh, uh, but now I'm just working. And uh, I have done a few things in my uh, lifetime, and I'm not done yet. So I want to do more of them. And I happen to be in the middle of the AI superstore. Uh, I remembered like when I told my friends I was going to work at Microsoft at AI in October of last year, they kind of laughed at me. Like, oh, what a dumb idea. But then December, oh, chat GPT moment. <laughs> uh, I was like, oh, wow. You know? So uh, I've been um, uh, writing code with this new kind of AI. Since uh, actually, like, uh, started like when OpenAI was in uh, beta access uh, around a year and a half ago, and I was astounded by it. And then uh, by having early access to GPT-4 uh, in October of last year, I was like, "Whoa, this is sort of strange." Um, and uh, ever since then, I've just been uh, consuming as much uh, as possible to understand where this is headed. I can tell you that. I don't know, because it keeps changing every day. It's pretty amazing. So, uh, and I keep telling people if you're a retirement age, you lucked out. <laughs> really lucked out. Uh, if you're middle age, it's gonna be pretty hard. Stuff's gonna change. If you're like in college, wow, hard. <laughs> Very hard. Now, um, I hope that I can share with you some ideas that may be useful uh, in the time we have allotted. Uh, this is stuff I used to do. I used to draw um, <coughs> pictures in Adobe Postscript uh, for my computer programs. Postscript is a computer programming language. Many of you probably don't know what Postscript is because uh, it's not a thing anymore, but it lives inside the printer. Many printers uh, use Postscript. There was a time when you only print documents with text on them. Before we read that, I'm sorry, I eat almonds, and so I'm coughing a second. <laughs> that was a bad call. <laughs> yeah, calories, yeah, calories are but I don't know. Okay, um, and I made this on Postscript, uh, and I am. Um, you know, the neat thing about computation is it's kind of weird. Because you can tell them to do the same thing over and over. You tell them to do it. They'll do it two times. Boom, boom. Tell them to do it 10,000 times. Boom, 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 boom. You can tell them to do things forever. Uh, you know your phone, your phone in your pocket, it's in an infinite loop right now. It's always going to wait for you to do something. Can you imagine, like, if someone told you to run around a circle forever? That'd kind of be not good. But computation is good at doing things forever, or many things in a second. It's uh, quite unnatural. Um, but it is the foundation of everything we're in right now. But anyways, 1990s, I was very interested in how I could draw a loop, and I could draw a hundred loops, and I'd get tired. But I realized with this drawing, I made it draw 10,000 loops. I didn't sweat at all. This is 1993. Anyways, I used to make these kinds of things, um, and I have been at this boundary uh, between design and computation. That's me in the middle. Um, and I've written different books over the years to try to understand it myself. Very clear. I've written books because I didn't understand it, and I had to, try, had to somehow understand it. Uh, and that was useful uh, because uh, I was making stuff for different people, and uh, people would ask me how I did that. So in the 90s, I was a kind of a weirdo because I was like, you know, writing code, designing things, and um, <laughs> a lot of people hated me then, 
Is it very clear? Like I'd be at a party in New York, I'd sit down and we're having dinner and we play some stuff south and like, oh, I'm like, and whatever. Like, oh. And so I'm John Maida. Someone gets like, I don't like you. Because <laughs> you're saying that code is going to be an important thing. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, well, I was making things like uh, this is a, I did a project for Google in the early years. Uh, different uh, widgets to live on the Google screen. Uh, this is my uh, favorite thing I wrote at the time. It's an about clock. It's an ode to the West Coast. We'll <laughs> I don't know, it's about this time. So uh, that was a thing. I designed shoes, all kind of graphics. Anyways, um, it came from a realization that uh, I'm really interested in art, as someone in technology. And I, I like finding. You know, not like everything's a puzzle, right? All of you are a puzzle. So I piece you together somehow and make a sense of it all, right? This little gestalt desire. Um, but I love finding words and words. So like heart, I love how the word heart has art in it. That's kind of comforting as a Friday thought, I think. <laughs> um, and I, I found this bumper sticker that said the word earth without art is just eh. <laughs> right? So it's kind of validation that, you know, because it's like art's not going to afford me to tell them that, I'll stop in their trap. They'll be a little confused, I guarantee you. Uh, but just sort of like uh, phase them a little bit. Okay. Uh, I have a collection of things from uh, around the world. Uh, when I used to be in a lot of airports, and the problem with uh, flying somewhere is you often get stuck. You often get stuck. So this is the most beautiful sculpture uh, that I've seen. It is a in Santa Barbara. It's a seaplane. It's like it's like a beautiful mobile. It's like a beautiful kinetic sculpture. So if you ever get stuck in Santa Barbara, spend time there outside. It's amazing. Uh, I also collect artwork in bathrooms. This is a robot I discovered. <laughs> this is pretty cool, right? So I was like, what is this thing? And, you know, I was like, I just sat there. I could have been there forever, like, just a plane. <laughs> it was kind of amazing, right? It's like, what's happening here? Is this, is this the art in the airport? <laughs> you know, public art? It's like really good art, huh? Um, and uh, this is a stall I walked into, mass bathroom. I was at the women's bathroom, had the same problem. Uh, but uh, there's like toilet paper sitting outside the enclosed metal, you know, container, and I was like, oh, awkward. Uh, <laughs> but someone had set this up. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what is happening here? <laughs> like, Insulation, right? So I was like, wow, there's all this art everywhere. But again, it's art because we humans choose to make it art. We interpret it. We have this gift of trying to make sense of things. And I would argue that what is important in this AI era, uh, so-called large language models, and also relatedly, uh, multimodal models, ones that go beyond uh, language, uh, is language that is the binding component of all of these multimodal models. And we're discovering that language is really, really useful as a tool. Um, and so we all can read these images and you really also like, eh, not interesting, or like, huh, interesting, because we're reading things, we're converting it from visual into a semantic representation that resonates with us somehow. And we find our, okay, now, pause for a second. It's very important to remember that this new kind of AI is not sentient. If there's no like uh, spirit being behind it or whatever, like uh, you know how like you're using this kind of AI. Who uses ChatGPT? Probably a little bit, Ambar or whatever. If you use it, you're like, wow, you really got me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you really got me. Okay, we started out and you didn't get me, but after a while, you get me. Now, why do you feel that way? 
it's kind of like you get on the airplane, you're by yourself, talking about yourself, sit down, that makes a stranger. Maybe the stranger is kind of chatty. You're like, ah, oh, depends upon what mood you're in. Hey, how you doing? Awkward. Great. If you're, if you're introverted like me, you go there. Uh huh. And they're like, well, you know, I had an amazing day. How about you? And you're like, can't ignore them. <laughs> uh, it was okay. <laughs> and you try to like, a, but eventually they just keep pulling you in. Okay? Right? They ask you questions. You gotta give a little bit away. You know, they watch you eating your food. Maybe if you have food in that flight. Oh, do you need your cookie? Oh, uh, you know. Watch them away or whatever, some reason, like, okay. But if this is, imagine this is a 10 hour flight or a 15 to Australia. By the hour 12, you kind of know, like, oh, lunch is coming. I'll have your cookie. <laughs> like, how'd you know? Because I told you about the cookie or served that. Or you know that uh, big New York Times story about like Chat GPT told me to leave my wife or spouse or whatever. It was amazing. It was at all the daily shows or whatever. Did anyone ask that person, what were you talking with the bot about before then? <laughs> Can you imagine getting on the plane? You're like sitting there, and like someone says to you, like, hey, you look like you're having a bad day. What happened? I'm like, well, you know, I had a fight with my spouse. So I like to have a conversation. And just before you're about to part, get in your bag, and the person says, hey, just think about living your spouse, right? <laughs> is, is that kind of thing, right? What happened before that? It gets you because you're giving up information about you. Number one. Number two, the great words that this AI is going to, if you've seen Avengers Ultron, whatever, the sentient AI that learns, it's like absorbing information out of all of us at every second. These foundation models do not absorb information. Who's a ceramicist here? Any ceramicist here? Ceramicist. You make that gigantic clay pot in the oven and it's done. It's done. It's a, it took a while and it's done. You're like, hey, could you change it? No, it's done. So these foundation models are very similar. When they're done, they're like bricks. They're not like sponges. So it's important to dispel this, this feeling that it's like, oh, it's like sucking everything out of you. It's like smarter. It's a, it's a static uh, object in time. Okay. All right. We digress. Sorry. Okay. So uh, I want to tell you a bit about how I began. Um, so I began is uh, this is a part of Seattle. It's called the International District, rebranded from Chinatown to be more inclusive. Um, different folks living there. Um, and I grew up, uh, you know, uh, in a tofu store that's no longer there. It's like a family business. Now there's like a wonton shop. Um, and uh, I was always surrounded by garbage. So, and when you're around garbage all the time, it smells okay. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, it was always garbage, and it was very dirty, and, you know, it's like you're a kid growing up in that. Now, some of you have had this experience yourself, you know what I'm talking about. It's like, you know, it's pretty normal and natural, uh, and sometimes you have parents that are aspirational, who are hoping that you might leave this life, you know? And um, what happened is uh, there was a, a teacher in sixth grade that told my parents that I was good at math and art. And I remember my parents telling their friends about that meeting and saying that I was good at math. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember the omission quite distinctly as a young person. I'm like, wait a second. Like, weren't they, what, did they miss the other part or something? So, anyways, um, this uh, this curse 
is what uh, uh, led me to uh, really kind of focus on the math part, but be really interested um, in art forever. So anyways, many years later, I found my way through uh, like device physics and just plain math and uh, computer science, electrical engineering, I designed circuit boards, chips, things like that. And then once I like got past all that, uh, I like uh, flipped into uh, uh, art and design because I was, uh, I see my parents said it was okay now, basically. <laughs> um, and then uh, I did a lot of things in the 90s. And so um, there are, uh, in the 90s, you have to remember there was no uh, internet and there was very primitive graphics. And so a lot of the work I did uh, was to combine uh, computer science and art and create things. And then I went to MIT to become a professor because my teachers told me that I would never know if my work was any good or not if I didn't make students who could one day come and destroy me. Um, so I did that. You know, I had a, a amazing opportunity to recruit anyone on the planet to go to graduate school for free. And uh, from 1996, uh, that was my job to find and create people who could destroy me in this uh, way of uh, making things with computer science and whatever. And they all succeeded by the year 2000. So I realized I had to get out of it. Um, and so anyways, around the year 2000, I got interested in how technology was changing. And I wrote a book. Uh, thank you, Doris, for remembering that book from a long time ago. The Laws of Simplicity, which laid out uh, 10 laws of simplicity in the technology age. Um, and this book, I think, uh, was useful to me because it helped me think about um, how industry was vastly uh, ahead of uh, higher education. Uh, I had this moment in uh, 2004, roughly, when I wrote that book where I was on MIT's curriculum committee. It's a very special committee. It's like the, the main Jedi committee. I, I meet. And that committee meets every 10 years for three years, three years of deliberation, to come to the conclusion that MIT's curriculum is the best on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the result. Yeah. So like, Huh, okay, it's great, that's on the committee. But you know, something was happening. We were analyzing the student experience and we discovered that undergraduates were being mentored by professional academic and career advisors. You know, and so we're all saying, like, no, when we were MIT students, we had MIT professors as our advisors. This must change. The lightsabers were coming out in the meeting, whatever. And then there were two students on this council. They got up and looked at all of us and said, what do you mean you're going to help us with our future careers? You all don't have real jobs. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, whoa. She's telling the truth. <laughs> So I decided that at that time, uh, every time there was a financial problem, whatever, you know, budget, whatever, whatever, a finance person would show up in my office and say, you know, you're a creative person, so don't worry about the money. About the fifth time someone said that to me, I started to worry about the money. <laughs> and I realized I had to get an MBA. Because I have all these people from industry talking with me in this other language I didn't understand. So I decided I got to get an MBA something. So anyways, uh, what I did is I realized uh, I, needed a, I needed to find a way my assistant had just gotten her like a GED equivalent. Because there was some program at HR that provided tuition assistance. You know, I don't know, $3,000 per year or something kind of like, you know, not bad, but not that good. But, you know, I'm like, oh, maybe I can apply for this. So I heard about this tuition benefit. So I went to the HR office and I said, hey, 
I think I need to apply for this program to get a degree. Of course, they kind of laughed at me and said, what do you mean? You're like a tenured chair professor. You know, what do you need this for? You know, you have to fill out this form. It was like one of those like forms, like two pages. Yeah. And the um, form is all about justifying why you need this extra degree. What job are you aspiring for? So I knew this was like, this guy had the stamp. I didn't want the stamp. Why did I have the stamp? You can get the stamp, right? I was like, ah, this is a problem. So where it said, like, the job you're aspiring for, I wrote down president of MIT. Because <laughs> just in case I became president of MIT, I remember the person didn't staff the thing. But anyways, I got the staff. <laughs> and uh, I got my MBA, and uh, that was good. So I, uh, that was helpful to me because I think when you're a professor, you forget that um, the students actually understand when you don't know anything. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, I was like, I was a student while I was a professor. And I noticed as a student listening to a business school professor, I was like, wait a second. They don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> I was like, wait, do they know that I have those moments too? So anyways, it made me better at my craft of, uh, I think, uh, being a professor at the time. But if anything, it made me aware of how little I knew about the real world. So... Um, You've seen that movie Shawshank Redemption with a spoon. So the spoon was my uh, MBA education. And uh, what happened was uh, it was 2007, and uh, there's a, like a local university, Rhode Island School of Design, was looking for a president. And I read this very inspiring book that a friend gave me. It was called The Audacity of Hope. By this guy named Barack Obama. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, this is totally inspiring. And I felt embarrassed as an American for like not doing anything. So I was like, whoa, okay. And then I got uh, 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 like uh, recruited to go to an uh, interview uh, uh, for the RISD uh, president search kind of thing. And of course, it showed up 45 minutes late to the interview. Not a good move. So I was like, whoa, awkward. <laughs> Anyways, I had like 10 minutes, and I was like, so why do you think this is a good time to, for you to do this? I said, well, you know, um, there was a time uh, during World War II where MIT was called to service to be able to create the systems to be able to help America win the war. There was a national importance to technology. Could that moment happen? For the arts and design schools, uh, could that moment be the moment for risk? Anyways, I didn't have much time. I said that I thought I wouldn't get a call back, but I got a call back. So, anyways, uh, I became president because it was an Obama era kind of thing. You know, I was young, inexperienced, maybe it can work out. Uh, <laughs> but someone asked me, like, why did you take the job? You had no experience. Why? So, uh, that guy kept saying, Three words. Yes, we can. So I was like, I can do it. He said I can do it. So anyways, I became president at that year. Now, that was in May. And then, so there was a whole summer before anyone came. Now, those of you who will one day accept this uh, challenge of leadership, everyone will offer you advice in the form of random books. <laughs> your favorite book is always the first 100 days. It's also a variant called the first 90 days. You're unsure which one to read, so I read both. <laughs> and both books, however, said the same thing. As a new leader, you should never have a vision. Because a vision comes from the people that you lead, not from you. Whatever you do, should not have a vision. But what is the thing that everyone asks you as a new leader when you show up? No, what's your vision? I don't know, the book told me I can't tell you that. <laughs> so I was kind of stuck in this kind of weird, you know, loop. It was May, and then June, summertime, 
there was this uh, pre-college program, this very intense high school uh, uh, students from around the United States in particular. They have intense hair, serious t-shirts like this gentleman over there. And they're like, whoa. And it's like an auditorium with no air conditioning, not like this wonderful air conditioned auditorium. You know, sweaty, whatever. And I was like, whoa, this is the audience I want to test things on because there's no cameras on me. And they're going to leave anyway so I can try stuff out. So I told them I'm not supposed to have a vision, but I kind of have a vision, maybe. So can I test it out? So I tested it out. I had three, actually, I had four options. And I, was, I asked for applaud for the one that you resonate with the most. Right? So I was doing like a user research, by the way. So uh, first one was, I thought the first one was going to be the best one. I wanted to lead with or whatever. Something like, you know, the next generation of, you know, artists, you know, it, kind of, it was sort of appealed to their ego. You know, become the next Damien Hurst or whatever. And I got like dad class applause, you know, polite applause. It was a little awkward, you know. The second one, I forget, it was uh, sort of similarly lined up. But the, and so I was kind of giving up. But the third one was this one. Uh, it was building a justifiable case for creativity in the world, which I thought was going to bomb. But the entire audience of these, all these high school students, like, was like roaring thunder of applause. I was like, whoa, this one actually tested very well. I don't know why. So a couple hours later, I was in the, uh, the shop. I love shopping. So I was in the shop for like different uh, uh, arts and design goods. And a young woman came up to me and she said, Hey, I was in the sweaty auditorium. You know, I was really excited you said that thing. What was it you said? I said, What did I say? Well, you said the thing. You said this thing. I said, Well, why, why, does, that, why does that matter to you? She said, You know, I'm like a sophomore in South Dakota at a high school. And I'm considered to be the weird one. No one takes me seriously. And in that room, you told everyone you were going to fight for us. So that gave me the uh, focus for what came afterwards. Now, I had the misfortune in 2008 to become president of an institution that had borrowed too much money to buy buildings. And the global financial crisis occurred. <laughs> this is bad timing, it turns out, uh, to be a leader of something. Um, and uh, really, it was amazing. Uh, people really hated me uh, because uh, I did things that were unspeakable. Uh, for instance, um, I discovered the email system didn't work at Bobber. Uh So I converted everything over to Google Apps for education and the First month I arrived, and very <laughs> unpopular. Uh, but the students loved it because that's what they used in high school. Uh, I was also very active on Twitter, which no one used at the time as a leader of institution. Uh, it was way really more transparent. People hated that too. Uh, I tried many things, uh, and I really enjoyed it because I think I was there to help elicit change. One thing I did that uh, was fairly unpopular, was uh, uh, inspired by a high school teachers I would visit. You know, many people who study in the arts may end up teaching somewhere. And it was these uh, uh, art teachers kept telling me that because of STEM education policy put into place by President Obama, um, art classes were going away in the United States. It used to be like, once a, once a week, it was becoming once a month, it was becoming an hour maybe every other month. And many of the classrooms for arts were being converted to the opposite way they could be used, which is for chemistry. I thought, oh, this doesn't sound very good. Uh, so I spent time in the U.S. Congress lobbying for art to be added to STEM education. And I did that for three years. Uh, and that turned out pretty good. Uh, and, you know, when you get pushed down and something starts working, you all lead in the future, 
You got to make a few bets. And so what happened was year one, I was doing this. People were like, what's he wasting his time? Year two, what a waste. Year three, people's children were coming home talking about STEAM education and hearing it had come from listing. Suddenly, everyone was like, oh, yeah, that's our idea, not John's idea. That's success. All right. Very important. When we create things as artisan designers, we create them, we sometimes seek recognition. An artist's goal, a leader's goal, is to have no recognition whenever possible because it means you exactly change on a system. Let me give another example. Uh, I found this thing uh, called the square. There was this guy, Jack Dorsey, founded Twitter, had this idea to enable uh, anyone to sell things with this thing called a square. I was at this event. I was like, whoa, that's amazing. So I went to Jack and said, hey, can I give this away at RISD commencement? So I had the largest batch of squares uh, available to me, 3D printed, to give away at commencement. Of course, everyone hated this. Like, what is this? What is this gadget? Nobody needs that. I did that for three years. Year four, walking around campus. And the head of one of the departments comes up to me and says, Hey, John, are you coming to one of our shows? I said, Of course. This person didn't like me very much, by the way. We're having a pop up shop this year. It's said, Great. I love shopping. I said, uh, We're taking credit cards this year. I said, whoa, how do you do that? And she said to me, we use this thing called Square. I said, what's that? <laughs> it's a mobile payments device. I'm like, wow, great. I'll see you soon in a shop. Anyways, this is an illustration of how when you make the transition from a maker to a leader, your goals shift and change. So just to keep that in mind, success doesn't look like success as we know it. Um, success looks very different. Okay. So, um, uh, I have these two alumni I kept visiting in San Francisco who founded this company uh, with this ridiculous idea. There was a six-person company. They were saying someday people will be able to rent out their couch or their airbed and serve breakfast the next day, like a bed and breakfast, called Air Bed and Breakfast. I was like, that's never going to take off. <laughs> so, like, every time I visit them, the company would be 4X in size. And we're like, whoa, this, of course, is the Airbnb company. Anyways, uh, Joe Gambi, one of the co-founders, would always come to campus and tell everyone, tell all the students, let this be lessons for you all as well. Forwards, take the next step. You ever stop? Just say that to yourself. Take the next step for you. Anyways, I realized that he was talking to me as well. Take the next step. So I did that uh, president thing for uh, six years and the next step and went to Silicon Valley to work in venture capital. The venture capital is an industry where you invest in startup companies. And I did that for three years and it was an amazing experience, really. Um, and then uh, I realized that there's DE dollar sign design, uh, sort of more uh, the fact that design had commercial value in tech. And this is in 2013, 2014. Why is that? It's because we moved from desktop computing to mobile computing. It's a very important switch that many of you maybe lived through but didn't, weren't aware of. Desktop computing was for businesses. Businesses will force you to use bad software as employees. You know, you use a uh, yeah, you have software here you can't hate, right? It's like, what is this? I would never buy this. That's enterprise software. But consumer software evolved very rapidly because of the mobile platform. The mobile platform is 24-7 always on. If it's like not, not pleasurable all day long, you're not going to get addicted to it or use it. So consumer software required design. And mobile software required design. So that's what changed everything. And that's why companies like Airbnb were so successful. Because yes, it's just a way to rent out a room, 
but they made it a very desirable excuse or experience. Okay. Um, and to illustrate this, when I was in venture capital, I made this drawing of how back in the day of desktop computing, you would uh, check your email once a day in the morning and once a day in the evening. Because email wasn't streaming in all day long at work. It was more of a, a rarity. Uh, but because of mobile computing, so if you get two ouches per day, if it ouches all day long, it's just not going to work. So that's an example of how user experience matters so much more because we traditionally didn't use computers as often as we do today. Okay, now I could be boring with all of you out before you're ready to go to your next studio. Uh, I got 10 minutes. Uh, I could answer any question or keep going. Question, 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 yeah. You started your uh, lecture off with uh, some of the future uh, kind of generations and some of the challenges that are out there, right? Um, can you comment over the period of economics and design and how that's impacted the future and perhaps the history? Uh, some thoughts or insights into what the future holds for multiple generations and oh. and employment. How's that? You want the Whitney Houston? I believe it too. So first off, it is a very exciting time right now because. I liken it to uh, this new AI wave we are experiencing is as if the steam engine has become available. The steam engine became online, not the jet engine. The jet engine is coming. So I consider everyone who's in this wave of, uh, of progress, it's very important to understand the steam engine and how it works because every week and month, et cetera, it's gonna change so much. Um, and that's why I spent a lot of time, um, I have a new uh, YouTube limited series now uh, called uh, Mr. Meta's Cozy AI Kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Very cozy. In the Cozy AI Kitchen, I have guests visit uh, on a, like, uh, it's like maybe like kind of a children's TV show. Uh, it's made, uh, very economically, um, and it walks you through actual code for you to run it yourself, for you to kind of demystify how this stuff works. You know, if you're using uh, ChatGPT, WingChat, Bard, or whatever, um, you don't really understand how it works. Uh, whereas if you look at the code, it becomes more obvious how it works. And it's set up in what's called notebooks, that if you just hit play, like a, like a playlist, just help yourself smell how it cooks together. And um, there are going to be six episodes. Uh, the next one is going to have Paola Antonelli, a uh, dear friend from the Museum of Modern Art. So it's got a lot of interesting people, but and it's also got um, code to run with. So I encourage everyone to realize that this is going to keep changing quite dramatically. Uh, who has used uh, GPT-4B? Have you tried the chat GPT image capability yet? Yeah, so one or two people have. I encourage you to all look at it right now as architects or anyone involved in the creative field. Uh, it's disturbingly amazing. Uh, uh, what I mean is that, um, you see, in the old days, um, image analysis, if I took a picture here of all of you, um, I would write some uh, computer vision algorithm to figure out what's in that scene. Uh, let's say I had a human detector, face detector, got two holes here, two circles, or whatever. Like, I, I try to find all the faces. You know, there's some, like, there's a gentleman hiding behind someone's head right now. It's like, oh, I can't find that guy. But, anyways, you know, I would find all the faces that are fully visible and, like, yes, computer vision, awesome. Let's go home now. This new kind of uh, ability combines semantic space with image space, which is much more powerful. Because if I take a picture of this with uh, 4B, uh, 4B uh, may find a chair, 
may find two chairs at the same. I'm like, oh, this is like a possibly a seated auditorium. They get to fill in whatever else could be there. It is uh, very sparse in the, in the front, dense in the back. People are going to have to leave. They, or they just don't want to see him or his breath, breath is bad or whatever. I don't know. He's not here. There are different assumptions written down as stories every time. That language is mapped on top of the visual plane. Imagine all the architectural writing that's ever existed in the world of how this was described, or spaces like this were described. It's able to take all that, draw on it, and essentially build a three dimensional, not an illustration, but a three dimensional representation, a multi dimensional representation of what it's, what it's being able to uh, ingest. That is the way that a multimodal model works. And that was released to the public just a few weeks ago uh, through ChatGPT Plus. And um, it's, it's amazing. So anyways, uh, and the way you get past it is trying it out, running the code when you can, and saying like, huh, OK. Question over here? Yeah. Yeah, I guess I have to apologize in the beginning for asking this question so I get a better reputation for asking questions that are too long. Oh, he's, he's going to ask a very long question, folks. <laughs> <laughs> No, I don't think I need that. Though. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. 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 Sorry. Okay. Um, so it seems to me the question of the hour, the question of the century, looking forward to this stuff. And I'm asking you because you are in this world, but you have an eye on the rest of the world. Okay. You're not a, you know, a, a, pin, a, a what's it, pointy headed expert, narrow expert, but you can see the effect it's making on the culture. And it seems to me you're talking uh, to two audiences. You're talking to consumers of imagery, you know, your, your art orientation, but you're also talking to producers of the imagery. And architects are facing a future where it's entirely possible, not only architects, but, but any creative activity is facing a future where it's entirely possible that the new capabilities of AI, which again, we're looking at the steam engine, but when you know the jet engine, the, the general AI comes in, um, uh, it, it will transform everything again. And the question is, is where and, and does it even matter if the human survives in this? So as an architect, as a as a as a producer, a maker of stuff, it's super important to me that um, there's a connection made between the maker and the consumer, the maker and the viewer, or whatever, the audience. And of course, architects have a ethical uh, responsibility to their audience, because unlike artists, uh, their audience uh, has no choice about whether to interact or engage with their uh, product, their architect's product. And what has uh, uh, supposedly at least um, allowed even the worst uh, example of architecture to be offered is that human connections it's made. What's the question? Right, exactly. So my question <laughs> is, is do you think in the end we can get to the point where it doesn't matter whether something was made by AI or it was made by a human? Because right now we seem to be obsessed by this fact, particularly in architecture. But we're facing a, a situation where we won't be able to tell the difference. And if we can't tell the difference, does it even matter anymore? And if it doesn't, do we bother having people do stuff anymore other than becoming prompt engineers? Okay, so um, <laughs> first off, speaking for the students in the audience um, who will hear people who are asking these questions on behalf of your generation. Um, but don't have to live the consequences of it, like myself, <laughs> uh, in some ways. Um, I would just sort of rewind to the simple fact um, that some of you have chosen to never use social media your entire life, your entire childhood, etc. You still manage to stay away from it. Some people exist. That's going to give a different perspective to you, wherever you are. That could be interesting. There are those of you who are like, Dug deeply in, uh, seen all the pros and cons of it, knows where it's going. Um, that means you're well informed. 
I think it's a question of do you engage or not engage uh, for this new generation. I would say you have the choice but to try to engage um, and try to learn as fast as possible. And it's possibly because you're of the generation that can able to be able to do that. The problem with getting older is you start thinking too much. Start to overthink it. I don't know. I don't know. You refer to all kinds of things. The younger generation leads with audacity. Let's pause for a second. Remember the book, Audacity of Hope? Lots in there. Put the hope aside. Focus on audacity. Two words. Audacity versus courage. Audacity is like jackass the movie. Like, I don't know. I'll get a new shopping cart and go down the sink. I'll do firecrackers to see what happens. I don't know. That's audacity. You don't know what you're getting into. Courage is different. Courage is you know what you're going to get into, and you go into it. So lead with audacity in this AI era. Experiment. Try to understand. Take that experience and pull it into courage because it is the people who are able to make in this new AI era alongside whatever it is or against it that will be able to have very fruitful careers, regardless of the discipline you choose. Um, so I'm quite optimistic about everyone who can actually absorb what's occurring. Now, let me give you an important lesson in the last one minute for those who believe. Okay, simple AI lesson. Are you ready? Okay. So, two hands out, left and right hand. I know you're wondering. I know, come on with me. Come with me. Yes, thank you. Physical learning helps. Okay, shake those hands out. Come on, it's okay. All right, okay, good. All right. Right hand, right hand, right hand out. Right hand is generative artificial intelligence. It is using what's called a completion model. A completion model fills in the blank. Fills in the next word of a sentence. It's amazing. Fills in the blank, okay? Everyone who is right handed loves the right hand, okay? Now, move your left hand here. Who is a righty and never uses their left hand? Most righties. This is left hand. Very important. Like all you lefties who are amazing. <laughs> left hand, no one talks about gender of AI, gender of AI, whatever, you know. This left hand is a similarity. Machine. The similarity machine, this kind of AI, can do the following. It can find things that are very similar to abstract pieces of text. It can compare dog to cat. It can compare dog to my pet as a child. It can compare my pet as a child to an entire book. It can generate a number from zero to one that detects if it's kind of similar. Well, we can do it too. A computer, a traditional computer, you compare the words fog and dog, computer's like, whoa, totally similar. F-O-G, D-O-G, three letters, three letters, O-G, O-G. Maybe it's 66% similar. As we know, dog and dog. Dog versus cat. No similarity in letters. Same, same length. We know they're animals, but they're kind of similar. The similarity engine, the left hand, is the powerful engine. This is able to find similar things to be able to give to the generation engine. So think about chat GPT or chat whatever. I'm talking to it. After I've spoken to it for three days, it has this giant pile of information. And now, if I want to say, like, my favorite food, talk about my favorite food, my favorite food matches everything I've said. It'll pull everything out, and it will help the, it'll help the completion engine generate something regarding the context of what you've given it and complete it. For all right, one time. The completion <coughs> engine is stupid. It just makes stuff up. It just fills in the blank. Bless you. Thank you. It's a fill in the blank. It fills in the blank. And with no context, 
it's going to make stuff up. So called hallucination. How old are you? Three. It's hard to help. Look. It's like, it's not thinking. But if you pull out all the different pieces of memory related to my favorite color, everything you've written in your life, like there's that uh, yellow car that I own, or there was this orange pair of pants that I love, you pull those all together into a pile, and then you have your completion engine complete. It completes relevant to your context. It's this intersection. So I believe that this generation of creators are understanding that difference. And very important. These two AI models became so powerful last year to be usable at the roughly the same time. So it's a combination of the two AI models that are achieving this incredible chat experience. And what we're seeing is the first wave of these models is happening. There are more models occurring, like the vision models, that's right? And also what are called graph models. Graph models are able to uh, really model the underlying uh, representation information. These all come together in what are called multimodal models. They connect these things together in a kind of Lord of the Rings kind of parlance, one model to rule them all. They're called unified pre-trained models. That is a goal. Now, when people say they use the word AGI or scary artificial whatever intelligence, um, that is a whole track of conversation. And there's another track of how it can impact creative careers and how to accelerate them. Uh, I'm much more interested in this track and your future careers will benefit from being in this track and finding a way through it. Please visit the Cozy AI Kitchen and get cozy. Okay, I think we have had time. Wait, time? Are we enough time or are we going to go further? Are there other questions? How can you sit for like an hour? I'm hour, hour, hour. Yeah, please leave. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah, question over there. Oh, I'm going to be. I, on. <laughs> uh, my question pertains to uh, what are your thoughts on nerfs and how the those inspire models? Nerfs? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Google the Okay, so there's a question about NERF models. Okay, for those of you who don't know NERF, it's that like fuzzy foam football thing. Uh, what a good name, right? NERF. So NERF refers to these new kinds of image generation technologies that can take sparse information and generate entire uh, fields of view. So what do I think about them? Uh, no, I mean, I, I think that they're in their infancy when they are not tied to uh, language models. So we can imagine more three-dimensional representation models merging with language models, and it'll have the same effect of like, I have a picture of you that I'm nerfing, and like, oh, like I have this like a problem in my hair, by the way, in a college, I had uh, my friends would say like, whoa, how does your hair stick up so much? I want that. What product do you use? I was like, what do you mean? Oh, come on. Your hair is tense up straight. How's that work? What do you put in your hair? I was like, nothing. Come on, tell me. What do you put in your hair? You can tell me. That is episode. Anyways, looking at your hair, you have the same problem. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's for me because I'm jealous. But, um, it's kind of like that semantic information of a nerf reconstruction of you, and I'm guessing you're, you maybe probably have this problem yourself, uh, would change how the model could recreate something, right? Um, again, it's a combination of knowledge uh, and the physics. Uh, it's kind of multimodal things, so it's going to become much more uh, prevalent. Okay, question losing density and mass. This is good, okay. Question, question, yes, yeah. Um, I was wondering what, since you said like these models and stuff, or, we were talking about like chat and all this stuff, it's like they're not sentient. So I'm wondering what makes them intelligent, like so basically what you think intelligence is. Some people say it's compression or whatever. Okay, yeah, all right. Um, okay, so question about intelligence. Um, what makes these models so smart? Um, uh, 
uh, questioning how their new city spark and what's a new city spark. You know? Well, two hands to help you help me understand things. Okay, so understand them. So this hand is a completion model. The completion model is very good at resolving the following problem. I have a word puzzle. It says, uh, the best beaches are in. Okay. Now, if you ask anybody that, they're from Florida, they're going to say, Florida. If you ask them they're from, like, uh, Spain, they're going to say Spain. However, one of the data was sampled for producing the statistical representation of the next token. It's going to be biased that way. Let's say it was made on the West Coast. It would say like, I don't know, Los Angeles or whatever. It would say like the best beaches are on this coast. Okay. If you live here and you say the right answer, you're not hallucinating. You get it. Okay. That is all statistics. The problem with statistics, however, it includes bias. So if you were like hanging out with friends over here in the West Coast, and one person like, that was favorite beach. That's one person like, oh, Spain. Everyone looks at them funny. What are you, stupid or something? No, that's what just like here. Okay. So is that person unintelligent? And am I intelligent because I know the best beaches are here? So intelligence mapping to uh, statistical likelihood may be a way we perceive intelligence. The other side here, the similarity engine. There are many people who are like really good at abstract thinking, which is usually artists and designers. Do uh, you have this problem where like you look at a glass of like uh, iced tea and you can't help but stare at it a bit? <laughs> I think I see, I don't know, a pattern. I don't know, it's really interesting. And so you're forming all kinds of associations because your brain is very good at forming abstract similarities to something else that's very abstract. Whereas you may have a friend who's like, I don't know what you're looking at. I don't see anything in that. Uh, they have a different kind of engine. Is this person more creative because they can find a mapping between that? Is this person less creative? Because they can't see that, but no, this other kind of dimension. So it's almost as if these two models, when they work together, you could tune them. For instance, these models have something called a uh, temperature setting. It's a direct way. Temperature is uh, zero to one. So one means hot, zero means cold. So one means perhaps more kind of like statistically unlikely. Kind of random almost. Zero will be the most likely thing. Um, so it's sort of built in. Is that a notion of creativity? I don't know. My boss has this great analogy, of, um, which I think really uh, helped me understand this revolution. Um, we humans tend to fear this notion that something else is better than us at something. Even like the rivalry occurs, right? Like, oh my gosh, you're so much faster than me. I'm jealous of you. So we have the survival thing, right? Because maybe you will run faster than me and when the monster's running after us, you're gonna live. I don't like you. So <laughs> I'm sorry, you mean that way. But anyway, um, we got we're like always competing to survive. So another fact is that this kind of stuff, if you compete with it, think of it one for one, uh, a better way to think of it is it's from a different dimension. And the analogy he uses is uh, uh, how do we invent flight? Uh, humans being able to fly. We start off looking at birds. It's like, whoa, bird flies, mm, wing, feather, yeah. flap, flap, flap. So, like, there were all these contraptions to fly that looked like wings and feathers, right? And then there was a there was a the ornithopter example of like a bird like flying machine. It's like that's that's gonna that's how it's gonna work. But then. Uh, later people realize, wait, if I make a, an object in this form, like an aileron, I pass air over it, huh, let me put a, like a motor behind it, or a bicycle motor or whatever, huh, 
propel, fly. No feathers involved. No shape of a bird's wing. And it's flying. So it's almost as if this kind of um, artificial intelligence is not modeled after our own intelligence. It's a different kind of way of, quote unquote, a machine acting like it could be thinking. Um, I think that helps me separate the two. Okay. All right, we're sitting out. This is good. This is like my hair. It's good. <laughs> All right. Well, oh, thank you very more. much. Oh, no. Okay, okay one. one last one. Last one. Last one. Okay. I guess this is more of a practical question, but like, um, when you're using ChatGPT, especially with the image um, recognition tool that it has, do you have any advice for getting like constructive feedback about like an image, um, or how to kind of like maybe effectively communicate between text and images? Because like, it's you know you can kind of pick up how to how to like communicate effectively with one or the other. No, I don't have any advice for you. You're so new, uh, and also this is like the first uh, version of it. So I just, um, you know, this whole phrase pump engineering is interesting. It's basically trying stuff out. Because these things are so new, uh, they'll need a lot of experimentation. Uh, and also don't forget the models keep changing. So what you thought worked for a certain model is gonna be different in the next model. That's why it's a moving thing for all of us. Yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you.